Thank you. Annalise and I are under strict instructions not to swivel. True, what which will be hard. What happens if we swivel? I, maybe people get nervous, I don't know. Do you? <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> I'm already enjoying swiveling, actually. Good. Feel free to swivel. Okay. Jonathan, ladies and gentlemen, so great to have you all here. Hope you had a great festival weekend or weekend in general. This is a meeting of old friends, not only with Jonathan Co., but also with the Trotters, Benjamin, Lois, Doug, the friends, the gang, you know, all of those, and many, many more. So thank you for being here. Jonathan, yes, how are you? Uh, I'm good. I've had a very nice uh, weekend in Brussels. I don't normally come to literary festivals and have enough time to stay for the whole festival and go to see events, but uh, I've been to three or four uh, events yesterday and today, and those have been great. And there was the amazing... Uh, concert at the Bazaar on Friday evening, so it's been a really fantastic weekend. Glad to hear it. Ali Smith said uh, that she felt she could breathe again when she arrived in Brussels, um, that she really left a burden behind. Did you experience it that way as well, or not so much? <sighs> well, uh, Ali is... We are not talking about <laughs> elephant in the room tonight. <laughs> Not. I think we're we're going to have to talk about the uh, the brelephant in the room at uh, at some point. Um, Ali is uh, Ali is very Ali is many things, but she's also a very sensible person, and part of her uh, sensibleness is that she's not on Twitter, uh, and I am on Twitter, so uh, I have been uh, following uh, events uh, in London and the press and the discussion and so on in the last two days, as well as being in Brussels. So I haven't quite had the sense of uh, stepping into the open air and, uh, and breathing freely that, uh, that she has, maybe. Did something happen in those two days? Uh, no, I don't think so, except we're two days closer to, uh, to April the 12th. So, uh, you know, our doom inches ever closer, and we uh, still have no idea what to do about it. So, so you want nothing to new, no, okay, no. We can leave not. it at that then. <laughs> Fine. Let's move on to more important things. Um, soul food, novels. Mm -hmm. Your new novel, Middle England, Klein Engeland in the Dutch version. H has it been translated into French yet? Uh, it has, uh, in the sense that the translation's finished, but it comes out in uh, September, I think. In September. And do yep. you know the title in French at all? Yes, it is The Heart of England, Le Coeur d'Angleterre. Beautiful. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, which Very is a nice, nice title, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I, I said uh, this is a meeting of old friends, the Trotter family and uh, the, the characters from uh, the Rotters Club and the Closed Circle, and now we meet them again. And I was wondering, what came first, your idea or the, the longing to write about uh, Benjamin and the others again, or did you want to write about Brexit? Uh, no, I, I didn't want to write about Brexit at all, and I still don't really, but uh, Brexit is happening and I'm writing about uh, contemporary recent events in the UK, so I have to write about it. Uh, but Brexit hadn't happened when I, when I conceived this novel, I don't think, or started thinking about it anyway. And uh, yes, it was, a, it was a weird, unexpected longing to get back to those characters, really. Uh, how long had it been since Closed Circle? Well, it's since I wrote it. I finished it in 2004, so that's... And I started this in 2016, so... Um, 2017, so 13 years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as you can tell from the title of The Closed Circle, uh, I really, you know, put myself in a trap there because uh, that was meant to be the close. That was meant to be the end of the story, and there were only ever going to be two novels about these characters and I'd put them out of my head. And uh, a few things happened, a few things conspired to make me change my mind. But the main thing was that uh, the uh, theatre in Birmingham, the Birmingham Rep, the Birmingham Repertory Theatre, did uh, a dramatisation of uh, the Rotters Club, uh, which I had nothing to do with. I, I didn't do the adaptation or anything like that. But um, I went up to see it uh, with my daughters and my wife, a family trip to the theatre, 
And in your uh, hometown. In my hometown, yeah, it was it was it was a beautiful experience and a wonderful uh, adaptation, which actually got rid of all the grown-up characters because the Rotters Club is a novel which is uh, set in a school, and you have the teachers, you have the parents, and you have the pupils. But this play was just about the pupils. And um, you know, I hadn't, I literally hadn't thought about these characters for. 10 years or more, uh, didn't even remember who some of them were. And really? Yeah. And I watched this adaptation, uh, which was, which was uh, very skillful and very sensitive, and I was very moved by it, as uh, were my daughters, who had, hadn't read The Rogers Club, haven't read any of my books, in fact. <laughs> and uh, it's nothing personal. They're strict non-readers. Um, Ouch. What went wrong in the education? Well, the raising of your daughters. Yeah, okay, I did my best. I did my best, honestly. Um, and what they liked about it, what they found particularly touching about it, was the the sibling relationship between Benjamin Trotter and Lois Trotter. Lois in the Rotters Club, uh, something very tragic happens to her. She gets caught up in a terrorist atrocity, the Birmingham pub bombings of 1974, uh, which uh, which result in the death of her boyfriend. And she's very traumatized as a result of this. And Benjamin uh, kind of steps forward and is very caring and very nurturing. And, and in, a, in a paradoxical way, it increases the bond between, uh, between brother and sister. But I hadn't really noticed this element of the, of the novel before. Uh, or to me, that wasn't what the novel uh, had been about when I wrote it. But it came through very strongly in this adaptation, I, and I thought I would love to write about Benjamin and Lois again, see how they are relating to each other as brother and sister in their 50s, which is which is what they are now. So that was the beginning, really, the, the desire to pick up those two particular characters and uh, you know explore the love between a, a middle-aged brother and a middle-aged sister. So it might have been a totally different kind of novel if Brexit hadn't happened. Um, yes, of course it would. It would have. Uh, sense, yes, yeah. but I mean, then let's let's rephrase it. Then let me rephrase it. Then the events, the Brelephant, mm -hmm. came by, and then how, how? Yeah, what? What? How did you approach it? Because there are lots of events in this book that we've all read about in the newspaper. Even if we didn't want to, we would have heard it on the news. Um, so. Those events have an impact on the life of the characters, obviously. Um, but I mean, how could you keep up? Because news was happening at a break neck breaking speed. Yeah. Well, uh, did you keep a diary of them, so to speak? No, we have the internet for that these days, and that's changed uh, changed the way I write this kind of novel and made it much easier, I have to say. When I look back uh, 25 years now to a novel I wrote uh, in the 90s called What a Carve-Up in English and in Dutch called The Deadly Testament or something. Yeah, um, yeah, about the Winshaws. Yes, uh, yep. It's Mordent Testament. That's right. Um, you know, I, I look back on the research I did for that now and it seems like a prehistoric era when I was going to newspaper libraries and leafing through bits of paper and going to the British Library and looking through old books and meeting people who had been uh, witness to certain historical events and this kind of thing. The, the, the research was very first-hand and, and hands-on. And you still have to do uh, a bit of that because it's, it's actually that kind of research that brings a book to life. But, but to get the, the, the chronological skeleton of the last uh, nine years, which is, which is what provides the narrative framework for this book, then uh, you know there are, there are resources for that online, and you can find them in a few uh, seconds. Rather, in the way that when I was researching Expo Fifty Eight a few years ago, uh, you know, a, a task that would have had me buried in libraries in Brussels for years, you know, I, I was summoning up archive footage of that from my office in London with a click of my finger. You said that um, to you, the bond between Benjamin and Lois wasn't. Uh, at the front of your mind, uh, if you think back to um, the Rotters Club, did you reread both the Rotters Club and uh, the Closed Circle to be able to continue the story or pick it up again? No. No, not I at all. <laughs> no, not, not, not at all, but I hate rereading my own books so much 
uh, that uh, I couldn't that. couldn't even bring myself to sit down and read the two books that I was writing a sequel to 15 years later. Uh, so, can you can uh, you say why that is? Um, I, I don't know, maybe it's... I don't know any writer who reads their own books. What kind of writer reads their own books? That would be such a weird Anyone thing to do. Anyone? In, hello? <laughs> Writers in the audience? No? <laughs> um, no, I mean, it just wouldn't... Uh, it's like looking at a... Staring for hours at, a, at photographs of yourself when you were when you were that age, or or you know hearing tape recordings of your voice when you were that age, it would just be kind of mortifying in a way. But I I I skimmed through them to get the to get my facts right. Yeah, because that was what I was wondering. How how would you know? Because you remember the book differently than some readers will, and and what? How do you know what to uh, elaborate on, so to speak, in this in in Middle England? I found I remembered the main kind of bullet points of the narrative, and uh, the chronology was important because I had to make sure that these, all the characters were the right age, that they got married or divorced at the right age, that their, their sons and daughters were the right age, that there was consistency in, in that respect. Uh, I got one thing wrong, it turns out. I gave a, I gave a character a, a, a job, or, or said that he'd had a job in the 1980s, which... Uh, uh, a very uh, attentive reader wrote to me and said, "No, you're wrong about that. Actually, he had a different job." <laughs> But that's the uh, that's the only uh, that's the only thing I got wrong, as far as I can tell so far. Um, but I found that I could remember the, particularly having seen the Rosses Club on stage, I found that I could I had a very clear memory of the emotional outline of the two books, mm -hmm. and um, I didn't need to to go back and kind of read it line by line by line. Yeah. And I think that would have I think it would have paralyzed me, actually, in a way, and made Middle England very hard to write. And in a strange kind of way, the characters would have, the characters would have been harder to bring to life again if I'd experienced them fixed on the page mm -hmm. by rereading the first two volumes yeah. from start to finish. Birmingham, still very central to the story. Um, Benjamin's father still lives there. Mm -hmm. uh, I was thinking that's the ideal setting for a story that also talks about Brexit mm. and what came with that and what happened after that. Um, can you say a bit more about that? Was it um, yeah, the right place for you, indeed? A gift from the past, as it were? Well, this book was uh, had started to germinate in my mind and I, I knew that I wanted to revisit Benjamin and Lois and Doug and Phil and some of the others starting in 2010. So um, I, was, I was beginning to think about how to place them amid uh, events like the 2011 London riots and the 2012 London Olympics and this, this sort of thing. Uh, and then Brexit happened while I was in the very early stages of, of thinking all this. And that's, yes, that changed everything and changed how, uh, you know, I felt and how we all felt about the events of the last few years, and we, everybody started looking back, looking at science, looking for signs, and thinking: Is there anything in these events that could have helped us predict that what happened uh, did happen? And uh, Brexit obviously is uh, a story of division and uh, a story of divides in in uh, on many different levels: uh, a generational divide between old and young. Uh, education divide between the university educated and, and people who aren't, uh, and also uh, a divide between the provinces and the metropolis, I think, because London voted overwhelmingly to remain in the European Union. And what the writer Anthony Barnett calls England without London, which is kind of the subject of uh, Middle England, voted overwhelmingly to leave. And I, I kind of felt I was, I might be well placed to write a book about this because I still feel that I have a foot in both camps. I left uh, the Midlands uh, when I went to university, so a long time ago now. Uh, but my family still live there. My mother still lives there. I go back there uh, at least once a month. Um, and, 
you know, the, my sense of rootedness in that part of uh, England has, has never gone away. At the same time, I've lived in London for, for 32 years now. And so I started to feel uh, metropolitan rather than provincial, but, but my identity kind of constantly vacillates between the two. And that really is what the, uh, is what the, the book is about. I mean, among other things, it's a story of a married couple, one of whom feels rooted in Birmingham and wants to stay there, and the other of which has a, has a yearning to go back to London and to experience life as it's lived there. And that is, that's one of the tensions that underpins Brexit. Indeed, because all these divisions, all these discussions, all these tensions, of course, are made to come to life in the lives of people, of friends, between uh, members of uh, um, couples, in couples, between uh, family members, and so on. It's it's often heart wrenching, but sometimes even fu also funny. Mm. That that balance you find is is. Exquisite, I think. Um, let's start with one of the, the scenes in the beginning. One of the characters has to um, follow a course to remedy driving uh, style yeah. and speed, speeding. And then already in that lesson, all kinds of tensions arise. Mm. And all kinds of privileges versus... Um, do gooding and so on, come to the fore. Where did that idea come from? Uh, do you have these courses in, in Belgium? I'm sure you do. That uh, if you if you're caught speeding, then you have the, you have the choice of uh, paying a fine and getting points on your license, or you can go on what is called a speed awareness course, where you uh, you, you sit with some driving instructors for for three hours, and uh, they they tell you why it's dangerous to speed and this kind of thing. You must you you have these? I don't know. Do we have those? No. no, yeah, okay. no, no one owns up, no. Uh, well, I've been on three of these. <laughs> uh, you probably wouldn't think that I was a speed maniac to look at me, but uh, but uh, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it's quite easy to find yourself on one of these things because... Yeah, that's, uh, that's an excuse. You know, if you're... <laughs> well, that was what I found so interesting about it because uh, the, the scene uh, in mid at the beginning of Middle England, which takes place on one of these, was the second, is, is a description... Uh, a very accurate description, actually, of the second of these courses uh, that I went on. And uh, I found it a really fascinating snapshot of, uh, of the country, because there were about 30 of us from all different uh, backgrounds, classes, ethnicities, genders, and so on. And uh, everybody there was thinking exactly the same thing, which is, which is a sense of, uh, of, of victimhood and resentment that they were present. And uh, the first question we were all asked was, uh, why did you break the speed limit? And everybody had a reason and felt that they were justified in having done it, whether it was because they were late for an appointment or uh, one person had got some takeaway food and wanted to get it home before it went cold and this kind of thing. Uh, but what every was your reason? Uh, I didn't have a reason, actually. My reason was that I was doing... 35 miles an hour in the 30 limit, and I wasn't concentrating, so that wasn't that was kind of a boring reason. Um, but the sense of uh, the sense of us and them in the room was extremely uh, extremely strong, and this is this is another and perhaps perhaps one the fundamental divide that Britain is feeling at the moment, and it's such a hard divide to talk about because nobody knows what we mean by us and what we mean by them. But the, uh, the people in that room were clear that, that they were the authorities who'd caught them speeding and the two instructors, one of whom was, uh, was an Asian woman. And uh, from some of the people in the room, you could tell that that added an extra frisson that they didn't like being lectured uh, about on their driving by a woman and by a woman from an Asian background. She handled it in incredibly well. But I did feel at that moment that this was a uh, this, this was kind of not an not an angry country but but the very opposite of what our prime minister in the 90s John Major called it which was a country at ease with itself uh, it felt to me as though this was a this was a country which was not at ease with itself at all and all sorts of small but potent resentments grievances senses of victimhood were bubbling away and uh, you know, as you know, a book has many different starting points. 
Uh, one of the starting points of this book was seeing that dramatization of the Rotters Club. Another of the starting points was going on that speed awareness course. Looking back now on the three, um, I wonder, in, in Middle England, the word inevitable occurs, as far as I know, three times. And I know one reader has pointed out on Twitter that he felt, having read the Rotters Club, the Closed Circle, and then Middle England, that it was already clear what was coming and what was bubbling away, as you say. Do you feel that? That it, it was always already there and did you know or were you as surprised as, as the next person about what happened? Um, I didn't see that on Twitter. You, you must read my tweets more carefully than, than I do. Um, well, I'll <laughs> try and find it for yeah, you. Yeah, try and, try and find yeah. it and, and show me. You know, I, th I think it's easy to say these things uh, with the benefit of, of hindsight. But he um, said it based on the books. Huh? He, he read. Oh yes, the no, I do the know the person. I do know the person you mean. Books. Uh, uh, yeah, I was I was surprised by that because um, obviously the Rotters Club and the Closed Circle were conceived together and were conceived as companion pieces. So there were lots of relationships between those two books. But. Uh, Almost 15 years went by before I started writing Middle England, and I, I felt it was uh, not as closely connected. And uh, yes, now people are, are saying that thematically, uh, the links bet between the books are stronger than I thought they were, and and are, are different from the ones that I that I, I thought were there. Um, I mean, there is quite a lot in the Rotters Club and the Closed Circle uh, about the rise of the far right. And uh, I find that a surprising thing about the closed circle in a way, because not many people were talking about that at that point, 2002, 2003, which is when the, the novel is set. But there's, a, there's an important strand of the plot which involves uh, a character that Benjamin is known in his school days who turns out to be uh, a kind of far-right activist or enabler. And so, uh, in a way, because one of the things that Brexit has unleashed, uh, tragically, is a, is a much more visible and uh, active and threatening far-right movement in the UK than we've seen for a long time. I suppose there is a kind of foreshadowing of that uh, in the closed circle. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not claiming that as a victory for my skills as a prophet. I just find it in interesting that, uh, that that was there in the second book. Shall we have you read right now? Yeah, Would that okay. be a good moment? That would be a good moment. Okay, okay I'll please do. do. I'm just going to read, uh, is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm just going to read a very short passage from, uh, from the middle of the book. Um, mostly, as I've been uh, discussing with Annalise, this book is uh, about the relationship between uh, families and couples and friends, characters who will be familiar to people who've read either of those two earlier books. But there's also a series of dialogues uh, between Doug, a political journalist, and a character called Nigel, who is uh, a very lowly, uh, spokesman for David Cameron and his government. And I included these dialogues because I wanted to get some sense of what was going on uh, in Westminster at the time and how that was shaping uh, the overall narrative. Um, this character is called Nigel. He's, he's young and hopelessly enthusiastic and uh, he, he meets with Douglas about once every few months to, to brief him on what's going on. And this is a dialogue they have just uh, after the 2016 referendum has been announced. Exciting times, Douglas, Nigel said. Incredibly exciting times. Who was it who said, may you live in exciting times? It was Confucius, said Doug, and it was interesting times. I'm sure what he really meant was exciting, said Nigel. Perhaps it got lost in translation. He said interesting, said Doug, and it was meant to be a curse. He didn't mean that it was a good thing. How can it not be a good thing to live in exciting times, said Nigel. You writers and intellectuals, you're so negative about everything. Yep, that's us, said Doug, tipping two generous spoonfuls of sugar into his cappuccino, always looking on the dark side. People have had enough of intellectuals, said Nigel. A sudden gleam appeared in his eye as he was struck by the brilliance of this phrase. Wait a minute, let me write that down. Don't let your pearls of wisdom go to waste, said Doug, smiling as he watched him scribble in a notebook. With a bit of tweaking, that could become quite a soundbite, said Nigel. 
They were meeting, as usual, at the cafe next to Temple Underground Station. A few weeks earlier, David Cameron had visited Brussels to negotiate a new deal with the European Union, hoping to extract concessions which would give Britain exceptional status, even more exceptional than it had already, and pacify the country's seemingly ever more vocal army of Eurosceptics. Immediately afterwards, he announced the date of the promised referendum on Britain's EU membership, 23rd of June, the second day of the Glastonbury Festival, as it happened. Well then, that's 100,000 young people who won't be bothering to vote, isn't it, Doug said. Postal votes will be available for young and old alike, Nigel said. Dave has foreseen every eventuality, including the one where he loses and we have to leave the EU. Every probable eventuality, I should say. What happens if he does lose? Will he resign? Dave? Never. He's not a quitter. What if the result's too close to call? Why do journalists love hypothetical questions so much? Everything is hypothetical with you. What happens if you lose? What happens if we leave the EU? What happens if Donald Trump becomes US president? You live in a fantasy world, you people. <laughs> Why don't you ask me some practical questions, like what will be the three, three main planks of Dave's campaign strategy? OK, then. What will be the three main planks of Dave's campaign strategy? I'm not at liberty to say that. <laughs> Frustrated, Doug tried a different tack. Look, supposing the people vote for Brexit and we... Excuse me, Nigel said. I have to interrupt you there. Supposing the people vote for what? Brexit. Nigel looked at him in astonishment. How on earth did you come up with that word? Isn't that what people are calling it? I thought it was called Brexit. What? Brexit? That's what we've been calling it. What? Who? Dave and the whole team. Everybody else is calling it Brexit. Where did you get Brexit from? I don't know. We thought that's what it was called. <laughs> he wrote in his notebook again. Brexit? You sure? Quite sure. It's a portmanteau word. British exit. British exit. But surely that would be Brexit. <laughs> well, the Greeks called it Grexit. The Greeks, but they haven't left the European Union. <laughs> no, but they were thinking about it. But we're not Greeks. We should have our own word for it. We do. Brexit. <laughs> but we've been calling it Brexit. <laughs> Nigel shook his head and made even more extensive notes. This is going to be an absolute bombshell in the next cabinet meeting. I hope I'm not the one who has to break it to them. Well, said Doug, since you're convinced it's not going to happen, you don't really need a word for it, do you? <laughs> Nigel smiled happily when he heard this. Of course, you're absolutely right. It's not going to happen, so we don't need a word for it. There you are, then. After all, in a year's time, all this silly business will be forgotten. Nobody will even remember that people wanted to Brexit. All the opinion polls say that Dave is going to win. He has to win. He has to win because he has four more years in office, and he owes it to the British people to carry on. Great, said Doug. Four more years of austerity cuts to social services, cuts to welfare, creeping privatization of the NHS. Exactly, you see, there's so much to do. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I have to ask, Brexit, was there ever such a misunderstanding? Yes, there was. Um, <laughs> this is where I got the idea for the, for the scene because uh, one of the things I wanted to, I, I looked up on the internet was when people started using the word Brexit, and it was, uh, it was 2012. Uh, but rather like the, uh, the fight between VHS and Betamax and other uh, formats, there was another word uh, current at the time. People were calling it Brexit. And uh, the two words fought it out uh, in the newspapers for a while, and then uh, Brexit won. So, yes, it could have, we could have been Brexiting. Who would have thought it? <laughs> <laughs> then we couldn't say a brelephant, though. The brelephant in the or room, no, that's yeah. true. It would have to be <laughs> another animal. Um, I, I, do you feel um, part of the elite, the shunned elite, the looked down upon elite, the rejected elite? Well, this is uh, another of those words that we're going to have to think about more carefully and, and try to uh, define and, and be certain about what, what we mean because, uh, you know, the... Obviously, the divide between the elite and the people is, is one of the tropes that people uh, talk about when they talk about not just Brexit, but uh, the rise of uh, populism generally. And yet, nobody really knows uh, exactly who the elite are. 
Um, I don't think it's to do uh, with uh, money or background necessarily, because Donald Trump, for instance, who is an extremely wealthy businessman, is not considered elite, or at least positions himself as not being elite. Uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg and Boris Johnson, two of the hardest Brexiters in the UK who both went to Eton and are both very wealthy, are also apparently not part of the elite, but they're on the side of the people. So what does this, what does this word mean? Uh, I suppose it's, it's crystallized in the book in a scene between... Uh, there's a young married couple called Sophie and Ian. Sophie is the woman who wants to come and live in London. Ian is the one who wants to stay in the Midlands. Uh, Ian, as it gradually becomes clear during the book, is going to vote uh, to leave the EU. Sophie uh, is going to vote to remain. And they have uh, an argument about this uh, at what is meant to be a nice uh, family dinner to celebrate his mother's birthday. And it becomes very bitter and very personal. And uh, this is a few weeks before the referendum, and uh, Ian looks at Sophie and says, you do realize you're going to lose this referendum, don't you? And she says, no, of course, that's not going to happen. Why do you think that would happen? And he points at her across the table and says, because of people like you. And uh, what he means, I guess, is uh, someone who presumes not just to have uh, a different opinion, but a better opinion. And what he's, what he's uh, attacking her for is her air of what he calls moral superiority. Uh, and I, th I think that is what people mean when they, when, they, uh, when they point at a certain class of people and call them, call them the elite. Uh, people who presume to speak for everybody, but in fact only speak uh, for their own interests or whatever. Um, but yes, it, it has, uh, you know, it has, I think, led to a lot of soul searching among liberals and the left and intellectuals and writers and this uh, this kind of person in the UK. And you know, maybe in my more optimistic moments, I think that what's going to come out of this process is is uh, a better understanding of ourselves, uh, a realignment of the power relationships between people and so on, perhaps a reform of our political system, who knows where this terrible crisis uh, is going to lead us. But I, I think there is a general consensus, at least, that what we cannot go back to is the status quo of, of 2016. So whatever comes next will be different. Mm -hmm. And hopefully better. We've talked about division and, and contention and tension in general um, for characters in the book for society at large. Let's talk about what holds the book together and holds the characters in the book together. For instance, rivers are running through the book as, um, as a motive for time, for, for continuity, for peacefulness, for what do, do they mean for you? Both the Severn, where Benjamin Trotter is living quietly withdrawn a little bit, mm -hmm. still writing his giant novel, musical novel. His Roman Fleuve, yeah, voilà. appropriately for the side of a river. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's a river in France as well, because we have to talk about France as well uh, in a moment. Mm -hmm. but why the rivers? Um, I think because I wanted uh, the reader to have a sense in this book uh, that you know, behind all the uh, the political fighting that's going on, behind the kind of relentless contemporaneity of the book or near contemporaneity, uh, we need to hold on to this sense that uh, you know certain things remain constant and remain timeless, and indeed life goes on as life continues to go on for for people in the UK at the moment. Whatever is happening uh, in Westminster or wherever that is going to take us. And so, yes, the river becomes a symbol of, uh, of, of continuity. Um, one of, I mean, Nigel Farage has said many, many terrible things in his career. I think almost the worst of them was when he said uh, after the referendum that the British people had won Brexit without a single shot being fired. 
uh, because, of course, uh, a British politician uh, died during the referendum campaign. Joe Cox. Joe Cox, the Labour MP, was uh, assassinated by a far-right terrorist just uh, a week before we went to the polls. And uh, she said in her maiden speech to the House of Commons, uh, this very simple and very naive thing, which has become... Uh, quoted a lot, and which I quote as the epigraph to the third part of the book, which is that uh, we have far more in common, in her opinion, we have far more in common than that which divides us. And uh, that is a truth that I think we have to, however simple and however obvious it seems, it's a truth we have to hold on to uh, in the midst of uh, what's going on around us. And, uh, you know, I've, I've tried to embed that feeling into the novel on as many levels as possible, and the, the river imagery is, is one of them. Okay. And music is? Music, yes, that's true. You, you cite songs, songs are, uh, and in, in various, at various stages of the novel, but you wanted to have us listen to one in particular? Or ah. Is yeah, I don't, where, was anybody at the uh, concert at the Bazaar on, on Friday night? Yeah, because yes. I read a bit from the book there, and um, I read uh, the lyrics of this song that Benjamin listens to at the beginning and listens to uh, at the end of the book, and it's such a beautiful song. Ali Smith stunningly broke into song on, in her event uh, yesterday. Uh, I can't do that. I can't sing uh, Adieu to Old England for you. But this was another of the starting points of the book. This was a, a folk song that I came across on record about uh, 20 years ago and wanted to use in a novel ever since. And uh, this seemed the obvious place to do it because the, the title, Adieu to Old England, seems to, seems to sum up the, the kind of melancholy and the nostalgia which uh, underpins the Brexit debate on, on both sides, actually. But I, I, I think Remainers and Leavers alike are both suddenly nostalgic for an England that either doesn't exist anymore or never existed in the first place. But this, uh, this song sums it up for me. I don't know if this is going to work. And who's the singer? Uh, the singer is a, is a wonderful British folk singer called Shirley Collins, who has been making uh, records since the 1960s. She's now in her 80s. And uh, we've become uh, friends since, uh, since I used the songs so kind of centrally in the book. And uh, yeah, it's, people should really know her work because she has a voice like nobody else. Say that again. Music and writing is what drives Benjamin Trotter since the Rotters Club. He has this big idea, big plan in his head. He's been writing away for decades. And then, actually, I, I reread a passage in the Rotters Club where, uh, from Lois's, Lois's diary, where they are, I think, on holiday, and she mentions that her brother is is carrying this dream that is so obvious to everybody who knows him, almost more obvious to the outsiders than to himself at that moment. I'd forgotten about that, but it was a beautiful observation. And then, ladies and gentlemen, in Middle England, Benjamin has his friends and his old teacher read, finally read what he's written, this magnum opus, I don't want to give away too much, but that scene where he gets feedback, mm. it was heartbreaking, hilarious, and, and so heartfelt at the same time. Mm. Um, 
were you afraid to be too cruel or couldn't you be cruel enough? Um, well, I already uh, thought that I'd been cruel enough to Benjamin really in the close circle, and that's, that's one of the reasons I don't like to go back and, uh, and reread that book, because uh, in my memory, at least, I really put him through the mill uh, in that uh, book, and he, he loses everything, his, his marriage collapses, uh, and he's wrestling hopelessly with this epic Roman fleuve, which also includes uh, uh, music compositions that he's been working on for years. And uh, you know his his whole life uh, collapses really in that novel. And, and one of the very first things I told myself in when I began writing Middle England, partly because the overall uh, political drift of the book uh, was rather dark and pessimistic, was I was going to give Benjamin some breaks this time around, uh, and that this book of his, which has been ruining his life for the last. 30 years was going to be chiseled somehow into shape, partly with the help of his uh, his friends and their, their rather devastating critique. And uh, and not only that, again, not, not to give uh, too much away, but it seems as though this book, having finally been whittled into shape and published, has disappeared into total obscurity because it's, uh, it, it's only ever put on sale in garden centers. Um, Again, I, I mean, uh, to me, the one of the things <laughs> things I really wanted to achieve in Middle England was to get a sense of the centrality of the garden centre to British national life. Should have said that in the beginning. We could have started yeah. with that. Okay, the garden centre. Enlighten center, us, yeah. because we are. Yeah. Uh, you, you, uh, garden uh, centre is important in in Brussels. No. In Can Belgium, I, say I mean. No? I don't think so. I mean, we, we have garden centers, but not as a central are they, feature. Uh, are they entire self-contained universes, like the one in in Middle England, where you can you can eat, shop, uh, relax, go and see entertainment, absolutely no. everything. Like uh, the entertainment, like clowns. Yes, that you yes, describe. Exactly. No, no, okay. no, 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 yeah. no. I mean, there are only a, there are only a handful that are on that kind of scale in Britain, but they but they are, uh, I think, uh, kind of curiously emblematic of, of, of life in Middle England. And they have bookshops. And the bookshops tend to sell books about gardening, as you would expect, uh, but also books of old photographs. They have, a, they have a hugely nostalgic bent because the clientele tends to be elderly. Uh, and a lot of books about military history and the First World War, uh, sorry, the Second World War and Churchill and all our other uh, obsessions as well. And uh, I thought it would be a, you know, it would be a, a good joke to have Benjamin publish this book called uh, A Rose Without a Thorn, and it only gets sold uh, in garden centers, and people keep bringing it back because it's not about gardening, and they thought it was, uh, they thought it was going to be. But, but after that, uh, his book achieves uh, a kind of miraculous success, and he becomes kind of almost, uh, almost a celebrity. Yeah. So, I, so I am, and he has a... You cut him some slack. I cut him some More slack, and he that. has quite a satisfactory romantic relationship off the back of it. And uh, you know, absolutely, he, he achieves happiness in this book. Yeah. Before we go, uh, I'll latch onto that. One more thing about the garden center and the garden sheds. There oh. are all kinds of discussions taking place in the garden sheds. Mm -hmm. um, a reference also to apparently David Cameron, who is now writing his memoirs in a garden shed. <laughs> is that common? Do you write in a garden shed? It's a shepherd's hut, Annalise. Oh, pardon. Uh, for which he paid twenty-five thousand pounds. So uh, it's a bit more than a, a bit more than a garden shed. Um, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> the importance of a garden shed and a garden hut. Uh, oh, and do I have one? No, I don't. Is it uh, my don't, my kingdom, my castle, or something like uh, along those lines? My garden well, there's, there's hut. A my there's a beautiful kingdom. song by XTC about garden sheds on their album Apple Venus. If there are any XTC fans uh, in the, in the audience, and uh, uh, yes, like the garden centre, they're they they kind of somehow surprisingly central to British life, mm -hmm. and they're a place where men, in particular can uh, escape their families and go and pursue their hobbies and this kind of thing, or, or write their hopefully best-selling memoirs in uh, David Cameron's case. Who knows? <laughs> Back to Benjamin in the book. Um, at a certain point, he, r he talks about his writing. I think it is in a conversation with the, um, with the young um, critic who comes to interview him. And he... Um, 
he refers to Hatfield and the North band, a music band, as an inspiration for his writing. And he says, um, the extraordinary modulations, key changes. If what you are doing is thematically easy to follow, if there is a strong through line for the reader, either in terms of story or ideas or characters or whatever, then on the cusp of fiction and memoir, that's it. I like to explore these liminal spaces, you see. That could be you write it, talking about your own writing, I think. Uh, well, I, I identify strongly with Benjamin in, in all three of these books. So yeah, there's, there's an element of that. He's also trying to impress the journalist by using words like liminal, which, uh, which are words that he doesn't use in uh, everyday conversation. Uh, but the, you know, the joke really is that he's, uh, he's trying to, exp he, he thinks he's giving a very lucid ex explanation of how his writing works by referring to a band who were active in 1974 and the journalist just kind of looks at him rather coldly and says, I was born in 1989. And uh, again, it's 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 part of the theme that runs throughout the book and which runs throughout British life at the moment of the the, the misunderstanding, the mistrust uh, between the generations. Mm -hmm. Just the other day, I came across uh, an interview with the writer James Meek, and he he uh, he drew this very interesting parallel, I thought, between uh, British concerns over immigration and the, the, uh, the mistrust between the generations. And uh, he said that he thought that he felt that young people had started to regard older people as immigrants from the past, and that older you. people were starting to regard young people as immigrants from the future. And there was, you know, there was, there was, a, there was a sense of the, the other entering their, entering their space and, and subverting their values or whatever, and, uh, that's what's really going on in that scene between Benjamin and, and the journalist, and in many of the scenes, particularly with Ian's elderly mother and Sophie. And, and also Sophie. With Doug's it's daughter and yes, others. Yeah, yes, that's right. So it's immigrants from the past and the future failing to understand each other and make a connection. And also, not to give away too much, but it seems to me, as I read it, and you've said it a little bit already, finding each other um, is not impossible. Friendship and love can overcome a lot of these divisions, if only we find out how. I, I thought um, uh, a line about friendship as a way to know how to play along, even if, if you think very differently or you have um, contrary views, um, is very, very nice to know how to play along. Is it really through love and friendship that finally, in the end, we will overcome all this division, or is that too easy? Uh, I think at this uh, moment it is a bit too easy, and I, and, I, and I say at this moment advisedly because uh, this was a book, as you hinted earlier, which was kind of written against the clock, uh, which, which I finished writing in... May 2018, with a scene which was set in September 2018. So, so uh, you know, the, the I, I, I wasn't just keeping up with the clock, but I'd raced past the clock really at the at, at the end of the book. And uh, in this moment, particularly with the way that things have spiraled even more badly out of control uh, in terms of our of our politics in the last uh, few months, it's 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 hard. Uh, it's hard to say that you're optimistic per se, but I did, so the, the book ends on a gentle note of hope, but uh, really the, the situation it portrays and describes uh, is not particularly hopeful. But I did want it to be, uh, to compensate for that partly. I wanted it to be a warm book, and I wanted it to be a book uh, about love and which contains a lot of love uh, of different sorts between, uh, uh, you know, between a, a brother and sister and their father, who they don't understand and and disagree with, and it's quietly angry all the time. Uh, who is who is quietly furious about the way that sometimes not so quietly furious about the way the country has turned out, and uh, yet the the love between him and his uh, his children persists. The love between Ian Ian and Sophie, which uh, has to somehow transcend the the political 
disagreement that they find themselves with. Um, I think it is, you know, paradoxically, uh, one of my warmest and kindest books, and and you know, may, maybe that is a simple reaction on the author's part against the, uh, the sort of nastiness of the political trajectory that it shows. And yet, towards the end, set in France, as if a bucolic France, the the what the phrase is. Um, let me see. I know. The, um, mm -mm -mm. France, 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 here, another order of existence, as if it is a mirage or an idyll, an, an yeah, Arcadia that you long for or hope for and dare not trust yet. Yes, the final, the final chapter is set uh, in a house uh, in Provence one evening where Benjamin and Lois have uh, relocated and there are also there's also a key scene uh, set not far away in Marseille towards the beginning of the book where, where Sophie finds the possibility uh, of uh, escape from the British reality that, that she feels herself saddled with, and, uh, but uh, an escape that she never quite manages to achieve. So uh, neither of these things really are the real France or are, are meant to be the real France. Um, in the in the final chapter, I, I use it as a kind of fantasy setting, uh, with almo almost the kind of uh, twilight, um, crepuscular, slightly unreal atmosphere of a late Shakespeare play or something like that, with the characters uh, with the characters coming and going, and Benjamin ultimately sinking into this benign, drunken stupor and listening to the Shirley Collins song. So it so it ends on a on a on a slightly unreal note, I would say. Uh, and as I, as I mentioned, that was the chapter that I that is set in a moment which hadn't happened when I when I actually wrote it. So I couldn't really, in any case, reflect the reality of September two thousand eighteen because it hadn't uh, it hadn't happened yet. You are very widely read in France, in Italy as well. Um, here, obviously, um, do you think this is a book that? can help continental European readers understand England more or um, vice versa? Who do you read on the continent to understand Europe and England's relationship with Europe? Um, I, was, I was really pleased when I got an email from one of the first readers of the book who was uh, a friend of mine uh, in, in Italy, an Italian woman, and she, uh, she, she, she knew, actually I hadn't said anything about my, my anxiety about how the book might be read in other countries, but she, she just wrote back to me spontaneously and said that, that she thought it was an, a strange and an interesting book because although it was absolutely set in, uh, in Britain and rooted in Englishness, in fact, not just Britishness, uh, she said uh, that it felt like one of my least English novels and one of my most European novels, and that everything that I described uh, in the run-up to the referendum, these were exactly the same issues that were dividing people in Italy. And uh, people who've read the book in Greece, people who've read the book in France have said the same thing. So I, so I think the, the peculiarity of the situation that the British find themselves in at the moment is that we're we're wrestling with uh, inevitable and very uh, bitter divisions, which are the consequence of all sorts of decisions that have been taken over the last 10, 20, 30, 40 or more years, uh, which, are, which are common to other European countries, which you find uh, with the Gilets Jaunes in France, which you find with the rise of Salvini in Italy, all of, all of these things. But the peculiarity of our situation is that we've channeled it into this strange decision to leave the European Union, as if that is going to solve any of these uh, dilemmas or resolve any of these differences, which, it's, which, it's, which is, it's not, because they have nothing to do with the European Union, really. So this is, this is my fear, really, that we're, if, and even this is uncertain now, but if we do uh, leave the EU, either in 12 days' time or two years' time or, or whatever it is, uh, the things that I'm 
writing about in Middle England, the, uh, the, the divides which, which tear the characters apart uh, so severely are not going to be have gone away. They're going to they're going to still be there, and that's when the shit is going to hit the fan really, and people are going to say, okay, we've how come we've done this thing that I asked for? We have left the European Union, and it doesn't make my life feel any better at all. Have you from people who uh, voted Leave and who read Middle England? Um, I think the the Venn diagram of people who read literary novels and who voted to leave the European Union is very small. Um, Which is a, a sad thing in a way, no? It is a sad thing. It is a sad thing. Uh, I, did an ev I did an event in London a couple of weeks ago with uh, Robert Manasseh, who has just published, uh, the Austrian writer, who's just published uh, a novel called The Capital, uh, set in Brussels and about the workings of uh, the, the EU Commission. And it was, uh, it was a nice event, a well-attended event. There were about 200 people there, and um, somebody in the audience towards the end took it upon themselves to ask the rest of the audience to give a show of hands and say, can, we, can you all put your hands up if you voted to remain uh, in the European Union? And uh, let's say there were 200 people there. 199 people put up their hands. Uh, and then one very brave person put up his hand and said that he'd uh, voted to leave. And uh, I looked at him, he was in the second row, and it was someone I was at school with, funnily enough. And uh, it's all kind of made sense. Um, so uh, I don't know how many people who voted to leave uh, have read the book. Um, I don't read uh, my reviews, but I know it got a couple of uh, reviews in, in leave supporting publications, which, uh, which gave it a bit of a kicking. Uh, but uh, so far, I haven't been, uh, I haven't had responses from readers saying that you know I've, I've written a remain uh, propaganda novel or anything like that. And and in any case, on the contrary, I, sort you of, I sort of bent over backwards to try not to do that. Yeah, and you make people voting for leave uh, understood, or at least their motivations and their reasonings are made uh, clear in the book. I felt. Well, I think that. For people like me, who maybe hadn't been thinking about this stuff hard enough for many years, that was one of the most shocking things of waking up on June the 24th, 2016, and realizing what the referendum result was. I just didn't understand why uh, so many people had, had voted that way. Uh, and I felt out of touch, you know, I, I felt profoundly out of touch with 52% of, uh, of the people in my own country. And I, re I write books in order to discover things and to, to understand the world better. And, you know, really, I, I, a lot of the motivation for writing this book was just because I knew it would force me to get inside other people's heads and to express their thoughts. And it would help me to understand maybe a little bit more, uh, you know, why people were behaving and acting and voting in, in the way that they are at the moment. So. Uh, yeah, I, I expended a lot of imaginative effort. I don't know how successfully, but I did try to uh, to see the opposing point of view. Mm -hmm. We are getting to the end of the time we have. I have a few more last questions for you. Are you going to c come back to Benjamin and and the others to write a follow up on Middle England at some point? I hope so because uh, that's good news. I really like uh, I really like spending time with these characters. I discovered, and I really I really enjoyed writing Middle England, which is it's not always the case. I mean, I you know writing is writing is difficult. Writing is hard work, frustrating, and all that kind of thing. And actually, Middle England wasn't a particularly difficult or frustrating book to write. It came very easily. I wrote it uh, I wrote it in nine or ten months. And I loved every minute of it, so I do want I do want to uh, to come back to them. I think, if uh, but maybe not for maybe not for another decade or so. I have, oh, I have oh. other I have other fish to fry in the meantime. Okay, but that that's good to know. But then, so get the diaries out in ten years. Asterix, new John Jonathan Coe on the trotters, on the trotters. Um, a suggestion maybe. Um, Benjamin has a daughter in California. She's a young girl right now, youngish. Yeah. 
So she could either turn out to be Kellyanne Conway or Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, I was thinking. <laughs> I think uh, the latter, probably. Mm. Maybe Kellyanne Conway would be more interesting and more fun to write. Uh, think about it. Anyway, yes. I'm giving That's you this idea. You are giving me a great <laughs> idea, actually. Yeah, thank you for that. Okay. So, uh, so See you, you in you 10 saw years. It, you saw it happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, rendezvous here in 10 years. And another uh, thing is, um, I have to admit that what you said in the beginning, Lois and Benjamin being very close and taking care of each other because of what happened to Lois in the beginning and then she looking out for her brother, I had forgotten that as well because there's a moment in Middle England when it's pointed out how close they are, how um, caring of each other, and I thought, are they? Were they? And then I went back, because I hadn't reread the previous two novels, and, and it's, it's all there, and it made me think about what you remember of a book, because there were other things of the Rosers Club that were very, very vivid in my mind and in my memory, and then so, the lesson I took away from that is keep rereading, and you can reread your books forever and ever and ever. And on that note, literally, a suggestion that's not mine, but for my friend and co -write, uh, and writer, E.J. Temelkeren, are you on Spotify? Uh, yes, I just, uh, I just played the Sir Shirley Collins song from Spotify, in fact. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you make a Spotify list to accompany each of your novels. There's so many references to great music we would all like to share. You've really given me some good ideas today, actually, Annalise. For I free. Mean, I, I, I or don't tell me they already exist. They don't, do they? Uh, what, Spotify lists of the music in of my books? novels, yeah. Well, not as far as I know, but you never know what uh, what fans have done. I mean, there have been... There have been uh, there's a guy who had a radio show in Italy who is a great fan of my books, and he always, uh, for the last two or three novels, I think, whenever I whenever I publish something, he does a, a show devoted to the musical references in it and the, the related bits of music that, that spring off from that and so on. Uh, and it's true, they do together form a very kind of distinctive sound world. And every time I write a book, I tell myself that I'm not going to use much music and I'm, I'm not going to try to... Um, Kind of make sense of the emotional texture of the book, which is which is which is how I uh, use music in my novels. Really, uh, the m the many references to Vaughan Williams in this uh, book are part of the attempt to do that. And I say that I'm not going to do it, and then I finish the book and look back on it and realise that actually, uh, once again, it's full of uh, it's full of pieces of music. So uh, they're not going to go away, obviously. Okay, we look forward to those Spotify lists. Jonathan Coe, thank you so much for being here. Thank you.